This is Craig Migliaccio from AEC Service Tech, and today we're going over the refrigeration cycle PowerPoint for a mini split. And so this is covering a wall hung mini split in heating mode with an outdoor inverter unit. And so we're gonna go step by step through the entire PowerPoint and explain what's happening with the refrigerant. And this is available as a poster to be able to hang in your shop or in your classroom. We also have PowerPoints available so that you can go through this and teach your students in the classroom. We also have our inverter mini split operation to service procedures book. So this refrigeration cycle PowerPoint of a heat pump in heating mode is reflected in chapter three of this book. So make sure you check this out over at our website, acservicetech.com, over on Amazon, Google Play, and Apple Books. A lot of people ask me, how is a heat pump absorbing heat from the outdoor air in order to reject that heat inside the building? So basically, how does this thing work? And so you have your outdoor unit out here. You can see the siding. So this is an inverter outdoor mini split unit. You see there's an, a rotary compressor on the inside, an EEV metering device. You see an outdoor fan. You have an, uh, tubing that represents the outdoor coil. You see a reversing valve to change the directional flow of the refrigerant. And then you have this separation between the outside and the inside of the building. And the tubing that connects the outdoor unit to the indoor unit, that's called line set. And then you have your indoor unit and you have just a coil there. And so this is different than a, say a single speed ducted conventional system that you may have in a building. Uh, there is no metering device at this indoor unit. The metering device is in the outdoor unit. And so both of these lines in heating mode are gonna be height and temperature. And so what's happening is the refrigerant flowing through the outdoor coil is going to be absorbing heat from that low temperature air. And in order to do that, the refrigerant traveling through the outdoor coil is gonna be lower in temperature than the outdoor air. Once that refrigerant absorbs that heat, it then ends up traveling into that compressor. The compressor increases the pressure and then it travels to the indoor coil. And there, the refrigerant temperature is gonna be hotter than the indoor air. And so this indoor blower motor basically is gonna pull return air across that hot coil and then you're gonna have hot conditioned air coming out. And so that's how it works. I'm gonna give you some examples on some temperatures as we look across this. So this would apply to say R32, R410A, it could even apply to R22, but basically we're just gonna look at the temperatures across the system because once you convert a pressure of a refrigerant to a temperature, they're gonna be similar in reference to comfort cooling air conditioning systems or comfort heating systems. And so this reversing valve is a device that uh, reverses the refrigerant directional flow in order to put this system into heating mode. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. As you can see right here, you have low pressure, low temperature liquid indicated by the dark blue color. And you see that at the outlet of the metering device. You see that you have high pressure, high temperature liquid at the inlet of the metering device, which is a restriction device. So it's lowering the pressure. And then you see that you have low pressure, low temperature vapor indicated by the light blue color, and that's the color of the refrigerant that's entering into the compressor. And then the compressor, since it's increasing the pressure of the refrigerant, it's coming out as high pressure, high temperature vapor. And so that is the dark red color. And so your pressure increasing device is the refrigerant compressor, and in this case, it's a rotary compressor. And then the pressure reducing device, the metering device, that's an EEV metering device, and that's right there in the outdoor unit. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Compressor inlet, you have low pressure, low temperature, vapor entering into that compressor. And then it's going to increase the pressure of that refrigerant. So maybe it's 34 degrees when it enters. Because it's low in temperature outside, maybe it's 40 degrees or 35 degrees. Let's just say it's 35 degrees outside. And so you have 34 degree, low pressure, low temperature, superheated vapor entering the compressor. Then you have maybe 130 degree refrigerant exiting the compressor. And so then <clears throat> you have the refrigerant at the outlet is gonna be the hottest in the entire system. So on the discharge line, that's step three, the refrigerant in this case maybe is 130 degrees. And so this is within the outdoor unit cabinet. So then the high pressure, high temperature discharge gas uh, is going to travel into the reversing valve. So that is step four, the reversing valve inlet. 
As you can see here, it's an up close shot of the reversing valve and the high pressure, high temperature vapor refrigerant is traveling through the reversing valve body and down in this tube right here. Now over on the side here, you see a pilot valve and a solenoid coil. Now that solenoid coil is actually, in this case, it's powered. Uh, it's in heating mode and a lot of mini splits are powering their reversing valve during heating mode and non-powering it in air conditioning mode. And that's kind of the opposite of most standard single speed conventional ducted systems that you may run into. So ducted heat pumps and things. Uh, but mini splits typically, typically, but not always, are powering the solenoid valve uh, during heating mode. So what's happening here is you have a electrical coil turning into a magnet, electrical magnet. It's pulling this iron core this way. And so what's happening is this little U-shaped slide is connecting. If you can see this, where this U-shaped slide is coming to, it's coming on the suction line. So the middle of these three tubes on the reversing valve bodies is always low in pressure. And then this singular tube up here is always the high pressure discharge gas. So it's taking those tubes and then it's directing the flow. We see as it's directing the flow, it's directing high pressure, high temperature discharge gas over here and it's shoving the slide this way because it's competing against the low pressure, low temperature vapor. And so obviously this pressure is higher than that pressure, so it's going to shove the slide that way. Your high pressure, high temperature discharge gas is also pushing down on this U-shaped slide right here. And so it's just traveling through. That's it. There's not really any temperature exchange except what's just on that brass body, but it really should remain unchanged. So we're still talking about, say, 130 degrees uh, vapor refrigerant traveling through. So then the vapor travels through the service valve, so it remains unchanged there as well. So then the vapor refrigerant travels through the line set tubing. So this is traveling through the vapor tube, it's still high in temperature. It may be 128 degrees here, maybe it lost two degrees, potentially, just exchanging uh, with the outdoor air, but you are gonna have both the vapor line and the liquid line both insulated. And so you're, you're trying to not have any temperature exchange with the outdoor air. But just say it's now at 128 degrees right there. So as it enters at 128 degrees into the indoor coil, it's then going to, so it's step eight, vapor enters the indoor coil. Step nine is vapor desuperheating. So it's going to desuperheat, which is a fancy word for lowering in temperature while in the vapor form. So the refrigerant is going to now lower in temperature as the indoor air crosses the coil. So you have 70 degree air and that's 70 degree Fahrenheit air traveling across this indoor coil and you have 130 or 128 degree refrigerant at the top of the coil the air is going to absorb heat from the refrigerant as it passes across that coil and is pushed out of this indoor wall mounted unit. Maybe right here at this point, step nine, vapor desuperheating, you're at maybe 115 degrees. You've lowered in temperature as a vapor refrigerant. Then you have the vapor refrigerant rejecting so much heat into the indoor air that it's lowering in temperature to the point where it's maybe 105 degrees. So 105 degrees where the saturation begins, and that is where you have liquid and vapor both existing at the same place at the same time. That's where the phase change is occurring at. And so at step 11, this entire step 11, during the saturation of the refrigerant where you have liquid and vapor both existing, it's going to hold that temperature at 105 degrees the entire time while the refrigerant is traveling through. So Maybe right here, the refrigerant is 90% vapor and 10% liquid, and it's at 105 degrees. And then maybe over here, it's 50% liquid, 50% vapor, and it's at 105 degrees. And then it gets over to here, and it's, say, 90% liquid and 10% vapor, and it is now at still 105 degrees. And so there's no change. So it's just a phase change. You're going from fully vapor state to fully liquid state and the temperature is going to hold steady so that's how you're able to reject a, a large amount of heat into the indoor air by holding this steady. If you just remained in vapor form or if you just remained in liquid form the amount of tubing length that you have would not be able to reject enough heat into the building at that temperature. So that's why uh, you have this phase change to hold that temperature steady and so that's huge. Now if you're at 105 degrees here 
at step 12, condenser liquid stub cooling begins. So sub coin means that you are fully in a liquid state and now you are lowering in temperature as a liquid. So once it all changes from saturated refrigerant into a fully liquid state, it's now able to lower in temperature. So between step 12 and step 13, you have your sub cooling. So if it's 105 degrees there and 100 degrees right there, you have five degrees of sub cooling. And so you've lowered in temperature the liquid refrigerant five degrees. So it's gonna remain at say 100 degrees as it's traveling through the liquid line to the, to the outdoor unit. Now by the time you get to step 15, maybe you have actually lost a degree or two of the liquid refrigerant. Uh, so maybe it is now at 98 degrees as your liquid travels through the service valve, but it's gonna remain unchanged as it goes through that service valve. You might just be exchanging some heat with the outdoor air depending on the length of line set that's exposed to the outdoor air, but you're gonna have your insulation on the outside of the lines. And remember, your insulation should be fully from the indoor unit to the outdoor unit right up to the service valve. And then where the end of the insulation is, you're gonna seal that as well. You wanna make sure that you don't have water or any air getting in, uh, any contaminants getting in between the copper tube and the insulation that can then cause corrosion over time and potentially a leak. So anyway, it's also going to be protecting from the heat exchange to the outdoor air, because remember the outdoor air is, uh, in this case, it's 35 degrees. You have a 100 degree liquid traveling through a tube outside. You have 35 degree air surrounding it. You might have a little bit of a temperature exchange. So you have subcooled liquid enters the EEV. So you have 98 degree subcooled, which is high pressure, high temperature liquid entering the EEV, which is the pressure reducing device. Now, Step 17, the EEV metering device itself, what it is is you have this little pin that's adjusted up or down. It's in a very small amount of pin adjustment up or down. And so that real small amount of pin adjustment is able to uh, change the pressure reduction across from the high pressure liquid to the low pressure liquid. Uh, so you, as you can see right here, you have mainly a low pressure liquid with a small amount of flash gas. So maybe 90% liquid, 10% vapor. So high pressure, high temperature liquid enters the metering device, low pressure, low temperature liquid exits the metering device, but you have a little bit of flash gas. So then you have liquid enters the outdoor coil. We're just calling it liquid, but it's, it's actually 90% liquid, 10% flash gas. And so at this point, uh, we'll say it is maybe 30 degrees. As the refrigerant in step 18 liquid enters the outdoor coil, so it enters at 30 degrees, it's already saturated. You have liquid and vapor existing at the same time. So the entire saturation or the phase change of the liquid refrigerant to a vapor refrigerant is going to hold that temperature steady at 30 degrees. And so 30 degrees is lower than the outdoor temperature of 35 degrees. So the refrigerant is able to absorb heat from the outdoor air temperature. And so it's going to hold it at about 90% liquid, 10% flash gas while at 30 degrees you're gonna have 50% liquid, 50% vapor, and it's still gonna be 30 degrees. Then you're gonna have 90% vapor and 10% liquid, and it's still 30 degrees. And so that's step 19, and then you have step 20 where superheating begins. The uh, vapor, it basically changes, it's phase change, to completely vapor state, and now it's able to increase in temperature. And so that's the definition of superheating. It's the, the increase in temperature of the vapor refrigerant. So that's step 20 after the phase change. So maybe right here, you've now increased in temperature so much to where you're at, say, 33 or 34 degrees. So superheating continues. And as you're traveling through the tubing and you're in a fully vapor state, you're increasing in temperature, which means you are increasing in superheat. So then the vapor enters the reversing valve. So now you're out of the coil and we'll say it's about 34 degrees as it's now traveling through the inside of the reversing valve going to basically remain unchanged as it goes through this little U-shaped slide. Once again, this uh, solenoid valve is still powered. You're in heating mode, and this small U-shaped slide is uh, putting low pressure vapor refrigerant on that side and high pressure, high temperature vapor refrigerant on this side. It's pushing the slide over here. The discharge gas is holding this seal down. There's a little Teflon seal right here. And so this low temperature, 34 degree, Vapor refrigerant travels through the reversing valve and exits as 34 degrees, it remains unchanged. 
So there may be a little bit of heat exchange just because of the body of the reversing valve, but let's just say it's completely unchanged and it's still exactly 34 degrees as it exits. So then you have your 34 degree low pressure, low temperature vapor entering into the accumulator in step 24. And so the accumulator tank, if you're going to, you're going to notice in the bottom of the accumulator tank, there's a bunch of low pressure, low temperature liquid. So during heating mode, depending on the outdoor temperature and if that outdoor coil is frosted, has ice over it, maybe you're not using as much uh, of the liquid refrigerant, or maybe if you're not at a very low temperature outside, you're not using as much liquid refrigerant. And so the accumulator is a refrigerant storage device for the system. And so it's going to either have liquid refrigerant gathering in there, or it can be drained if you're running at full, maybe 100%, or maybe even in a turbo mode, maybe you're at like 110%. But anyway, uh, so in the accumulator tank, the job of the accumulator is to protect the vapor compressor from any liquid refrigerant entering. And so it's only going to allow, the accumulator is only going to allow vapor refrigerant to exit and then to enter into the vapor compressor. So it is a storage device or storage vessel for extra liquid refrigerant. It's a protection device for the compressor. It also has a strainer screen at the top to protect it from any copper shards maybe from entering into the compressor. And that strainer screen also helps to vaporize any saturated refrigerant. So maybe the outdoor coil is fully frozen or like frosted. And so you don't have much of a heat exchange across the coil from the air to the refrigerant. Maybe there is no superheat. So maybe it's still at 30 degrees and you have liquid and vapor entering into the accumulator. Well, what's going to happen is it goes through the strainer screen into the baffles. It then separates the refrigerant. So the liquid refrigerant gathers at the bottom. The vapor refrigerant goes into the top of the tubes inside the accumulator. And then the low pressure, low temperature vapor refrigerant enters into the, into the compressor. And so thereby it's, it's protecting the compressor from any saturated refrigerant entering or any liquid refrigerant entering. And so it's going to help the system or the compressor out there as well. At the bottom of the accumulator tank, you're going to see these little uh, orifices, so little tiny holes, and those are metering devices to meter any, uh, any liquid that gathers, but really what they're there for is they're there to meter the oil that gets trapped in the bottom of the accumulator tank to then enter into the compressor to lubricate the cylinder. You don't want all of your uh, refrigerant oil getting trapped in the bottom of the accumulator tank because you got to remember that the refrigerant and oil are traveling through the entire system together. And so that whole accumulator tank could just fill up with oil if you don't have those little holes at the bottom. So it's draining it back into the compressor to lubricate the cylinders. Those metering devices are going to flash any liquid refrigerant that's down at the bottom there. It's going to flash it into a vapor before the refrigerant enters into the compressor. And so you then have the compressor inlet where you have low pressure, low temperature, vapor refrigerant re-entering the compressor and the cycle starts all over again. And so we have posters of these that you can hang in your shop. We have these PowerPoints available at our website at acservicetech.com. We also have our inverter mini split operation service procedures book. And so we go through all the different uh, setup of the, of the tubing and getting the system ready for refrigerant. And we go over charging, we go over recovery, we go over the electrical connections, we go over troubleshooting of electrical devices, how all the devices work. So if you have questions about mini splits, make sure you check out our book, which is available over at our website at acservicetech.com over on Amazon. So you can go there from amazon.com slash shop slash acservicetech, or you could just look up the company. So uh, the book is available over on Amazon and also it's available on Google Play and Apple Books. And so we have the full outline of this whole book and sample pages over the website. So make sure you check those out and hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.